This video brought to you by Loot Crate. Go to trylootcrate.com slash halocanon and use promo code BRIDGE10 to save 10% on a new subscription. Stick around to the end for more details. Welcome back to Halo Cannon. So a while back, the channel hit 10,000 subscribers. At the time, I wanted to do something special, but never really found the time. Okay, not bad. I'd wait for 50,000 subscribers. Nope, still didn't work out. But here we are now, and it's time to get off my lazy ass and finally do this. Something I've been asked to do for a long time, and something I've wanted to do for a long time. Today, I present the first of the flashback reviews. This series will take a look at past Halo media and, well, review it. But that's not all. You, the subscriber, will pick the next piece of Halo media I review. We'll get into the details on that at the end of this video. For now, let's take a look at the very first Halo experience released to the public. I present Halo, The Fall of Reach. Before we get into the actual review though, let's talk a bit about the history of this book. Fall of Reach wasn't originally part of Bungie's plan for the franchise, but instead commissioned by Microsoft. You could almost consider it Halo CE's Hunt the Truth in a few ways. Writer Eric Nyland, an employee at Microsoft at the time, was tapped for the job. In seven weeks, with some help from the mythical Halo Bible and a couple Bungie employees, Nyland produced a book which would lay the groundwork for years to come. In 2010, the book, along with the original Halo trilogy of books, as it were, was re-released to fix grammatical and canon errors throughout the book's pages. However, the 2010 reprint contained many of the same errors and numerous new ones. In 2011, however, the book was reprinted again, successfully making the changes 343 had intended. Halo is probably the biggest video game franchise in the history of the medium, and it all started 15 years ago with one book. Halo, The Fall of Reach. The book opens in 2535 at the end of the Battle of Jericho 7. Spartan teams red and blue are sent in to prevent the downfall of the planet. While red team stuck behind enemy lines to plant a nuke, blue team would draw out the rear guard. The mission was ultimately a success, but failed to prevent the glassing of the planet. This first chapter is brilliant for a number of reasons. It throws us right into the action, but not in a way that's too confusing. We're introduced to the Spartans, what they do, and who they're fighting. It's a simple setup that gives us just enough information to be intrigued, but leaves enough mystery that we want to continue reading. The chapter ends with the glassing of the planet, further establishing just how powerful and dangerous the Covenant are, all the more effective after reading about a Spartan victory. The next chapter takes us back to the year 2517 as we find a Dr. Catherine Halsey and Lieutenant Jacob Keyes on a mission to observe a child. This child is known only as John, or Subject 117. Pretending to be parents scouting out John's school for their own child, the two first see John playing a game of King of the Hill, his physical ability very clear. Halsey approaches John and offers to play a game of coin flip to further test him. She flips the coin, but before it hits the ground, John snatches it out of the air, calling Heads. When he opens his fist, Heads is indeed the side facing up. John wins the coin, and Halsey marks John for integration into her program. Pausing again, this is another brilliant moment in the books, specifically concerning John. All Halo fans at this point should be familiar with the idea that the Master Chief, John, is lucky. However, in this moment, we see exactly what the nature of this luck is. John makes his own luck. Moving forward, the next section introduces us to the Spartan 2 program. John, along with 74 other children, all age 6, are kidnapped, replaced by rapidly grown clones known as Flash clones, and conscripted into the program. Overseen by Halsey, the kids would be trained by Senior Chief Petty Officer Franklin Mendez. On the first day, they're split into teams of three. Here, we're introduced to Kelly 087, the fastest of the Spartan candidates, and Sam 034. During their first test, when they have to get across an obstacle course and ring a bell, John leaves his teammates behind. Though he rings the bell first, his teammates are last, and they all fail the test. It's an important first lesson for John, one that would never be forgotten. The next day, all of John's team ring the bell by working together, passing their first test. We soon flash forward to 2519 during a wilderness training mission. The Spartans are dropped throughout the wilderness of the Highland Mountains and are tasked with finding their way to an extraction zone. The one catch is that the last person to arrive would have to walk home. Using their training and a map provided to them, the Spartans are able to gather together and find the LZ. When they arrive, however, they find it guarded by men who aren't in any standard uniform. They decide to set a trap. The Spartans lure one of the guards into the nearby forest where Sam is feigning injury. When the guard reacts hostily, the Spartans take him down, 
following suit with the remaining guards soon after. With the LZ clear, the Spartans pile into the Pelican, John making sure that he is the last one on before returning to camp with the help of their AI tutor, Deja. Upon returning, John is called in to meet with Halsey and Mendez for debriefing. He explains what happened, and Halsey decides John should be promoted to squad leader. We flash forward again to March of 2525, as the Spartan candidates are prepared for their greatest test yet, surviving the augmentation process. The process would end up killing 33 of the candidates and crippling another 12. Only 30 survived. After a funeral is held for those lost, the 12 washouts were transferred to Oni to make use of their superior minds, while the Spartan successes underwent rehabilitation. Their bodies had grown and changed in many ways. Now they had to relearn everything. Here we get another one of the defining moments in the book and John's life. While undergoing physical therapy in a gym, John is confronted by some ODSTs. He tries to ignore their provocations, but is soon ordered into the boxing ring by a sergeant. In the ring, we get a look at what John is now capable of. In a matter of minutes, the four ODSTs are taken down, at least two of them dead. Mendez then rushes in, ordering John to stand down and informing the sergeant that medics are on the way and that he will be debriefed on what just happened. As John leaves the ring, he asks Mendez if he had responded correctly. He had been threatened, but his attackers were fellow soldiers. Mendez merely states that John's actions answered the question, that missions won't always have clear objectives, and that sometimes John can only follow his orders and protect his team. Not long after, the Spartans return to Reach and resume their training, this time in an old titanium mine. Here they demonstrate just how effective their augmentations are as they take on trainers and old Mark I exoskeletons. Impressed with their abilities, Halsey decides it's time for their first mission. The Spartans are to be deployed to the Eridana system to capture the United Rebel Front leader, Colonel Robert Watts. John is promoted to Petty Officer 3rd Class and told to select his squad. He picks Kelly 087, Sam 034, Fred 104, and Linda 058. The group stows away on the freighter Laden, which takes them to a hidden insurrectionist base in the Eridanus asteroid belt. Once in the base, the Spartans disguise themselves until they find Watts' barracks, where they break in, take out Watts, knock their target out, and load him into a cargo crate. The mission goes off without error, save for John taking a single bullet in his side. The Spartans proceed to load the crate into a stolen pelican, blow a hole in the base, and escape. Two months later, on November 2nd, the Spartans are informed of the attack on Harvest by a hostile alien hegemony known as the Covenant. Over the next three weeks, they are deployed on a number of minor missions against insurrectionist targets before arriving in the Kai Seti system. Not long after their arrival, their escort, the UNSC Commonwealth, is engaged by a Covenant ship that, while only a third the size, is still able to deal significant damage. The Spartans are deployed to Kai Seti 4's Damascus testing facility while the Commonwealth distracts the unrelenting. Once at the facility, the Spartans are introduced to Project Mjolnir, an advanced powered assault armor that would further enhance the Spartans' abilities. After a brief period of getting used to the new armor, they head out to return to the Commonwealth. On the way, John has an idea on how to take out the Covenant ship. The Spartans equip EVA boosters and try to board the ship. John figures that a small section of the ship's shields must drop when firing its plasma weapons, and this would be their way in. Ultimately, only John, Sam, and Kelly make it. They fight their way past the crew composed entirely of jackals and find the ship's reactor. Unfortunately, Sam's undersuit is punctured and he is forced to remain. John and Kelly manage to escape just as the ship explodes, taking Sam with it. When I first read this book, the whole Kai City 4 section was a real highlight for many reasons. First, the battle with the Commonwealth and the Unrelenting, the Covey ship going unnamed in the novel and only revealed years later. While we had been told before that a Covenant ship had wiped out the population of an entire planet, we see here just how terrifyingly powerful the Covenant were. A single Covenant ship is more than a match for a UNSC frigate three times its size. Second though is Sam's sacrifice. While we may be aware that John is the only one to walk away from this at the very end, remember Halo CE told us that John was the last Spartan, Sam's death adds a sense of weight to the fight with the Covenant, showing us that the stakes are very real and in-universe, the sacrifice would have a lasting impact for the Spartans. In fact, in Halo Wars 1, on occasion, Spartan units will cry for Samuel when attacking. It's a detail I'm forever thankful to Ensemble for. At this point, we jump forward 27 years to 2552, where we find now Commander Jacob Keyes in command of the UNSC destroyer Iroquois at the human colony of Sigma Octanus IV. When a large mass is detected in slipspace, Keyes, recalling a paper written by Spartan II washout Vajad 084, realizes that what appears to be a single mass is in fact a Covenant battle group. 
He prepares for engagement, but finds himself seemingly outmatched by a DDS-class carrier, a destroyer, and two frigates. In an act of tactical genius, Keyes is able to take out the destroyer and two frigates in a move later dubbed the Keyes Loop, forcing the surviving carrier to retreat, but not before landing ground troops. Marine forces are initially deployed, but are ultimately decimated by Covenant forces. As newly arrived naval forces prepare for another engagement with the Covenant in space, 12 Spartan twos are deployed groundside to take on the invading Covenant. Once on the ground, John, now a Master Chief, splits his group into three teams. Blue team would infiltrate the city of Côte d'Azur, Red team would scout the city's wharves, and Green team the residential area for survivors. Green team finds no survivors, but Red team does, and the two groups work together to evacuate them. Meanwhile, Blue team heads into the capital's sewers to plant a nuke right under the bulk of Covenant forces. As they do, though, John notices a lot of activity around Côte d'Azur's Natural History Museum. Inside the museum, they find the Covenant are scanning an indigenous rock and sending the information to a ship in orbit. Unknown to Blue Team, the Iroquois had discovered the ship, driven it off, and was intercepting the signal. Blue Team destroys the device and evacuates the city with the rest of the Spartans. In space, the UNSC Navy had engaged a backup fleet. Though many ships were lost, the Covenant were ultimately driven off, securing one of the first UNSC victories in many years. This section remains one of the best examples of space battles in Halo fiction for many and secured the popularity of Captain Keys for many more. More important to the story, though, is that this scene, while giving us a major high point, is followed up by a smack of reality as Keys reminds the audience just how bittersweet the victory was. While it was a victory, a much needed victory as Keys notes when seeing his crew after the battle, the cost was very high. Once again, we see the power of the Covenant and this plays into the novel twice later on. First, when Keyes and John meet in between their debriefings on Reach, when Keyes tells John that winning isn't everything, and second at the end, during the fall of Reach. Moving on, we jump forward a month to August 12th on Reach, where, as just mentioned, John, among others, is debriefed about the Battle of Sigma Octanus IV. Prior to his debrief, he runs into Keyes, and during their conversation, we see John's determination to win has remained intact, a fact that almost horrifies Keyes. Keyes tells John that winning isn't everything, something that perplexes him, and as I said, would, from a literary standpoint at least, play into the end of the novel. We jump forward again to August 25th, as Halsey and Cortana discuss the particulars of Operation Red Flag. Her choice of ship, the captain, and the Spartan Cortana would be paired with. A couple days later on August 27th, the 25 surviving Spartan twos are briefed. Red Flag would be a last ditch effort to end the war, wherein the Spartans would hijack a Covenant ship take it to the Covenant homeworld, and kidnap a High Prophet, all in the hopes of forcing a truce. Two more days later, on August 29th, John 117 is called to Camp Hathcock to receive an upgrade to a standard neural implant, and be the first Spartan II to don the final build of Mjolnir Mark V power armor. The new armor is an upgrade to John's old Mark IV in many ways, with two major upgrades being the inclusion of energy shields and the ability to carry an AI. Pausing briefly, I have to, again, commend author Eric Nyland. This whole section following the Battle of Sigma Octanus IV does an absolutely fantastic job of instilling in the reader an escalating sense of tension. We know from the title that Reach will fall, that something bad is going to happen. In between the number of pages left, the last effort by the UNSC and Red Flag, and context clues in the book itself, such as nervous MPs at Camp Hathcock's Gate the morning of August 29th, the reader can feel the tension, which makes the final fall of Reach all the more devastating in the pages to follow. Anyway, after receiving his neural lace and the new armor, John is introduced to Cortana and, as one might expect, he isn't exactly thrilled with this new prospect. John is a Spartan. He doesn't handle non-Spartan, and especially non-military, personnel well. Cortana is both, and so much more. With the two introduced, they are told they have to complete a live-fire exercise to test how well they work together. Unknown to Halsey, John, or Cortana, Colonel James Ackerson, Halsey's biggest rival since the early days of the Spartan II program, had arranged some special additions, notably a missile run from an AV-19 Skyhawk. However, with Cortana's help, John is able to pass the test, even utilizing Mjolnir's new shielding system to deflect the Skyhawk's anti-tank missile. Cortana would later seek revenge on Ackerson, sending a large sum of money to a brothel and forging a request for transfer to the front lines. During her quest for revenge, Cortana also takes a peek at John's full, unredacted service record, and is horrified at what she finds. She vows to keep John safe, to do all she can to make sure he's never hurt again, short of failing her mission. The next day, August 30th, the remaining Spartan twos would be equipped with Mark V and board the UNSC Pillar of Autumn in preparation for Red Flag. 
as they prepare, recently promoted Captain Jacob Keyes would take a moment to get to know what his new ship was capable of before ordering it on an outbound vector. The Autumn, a Halcyon-class light cruiser in service for over 40 years, had been heavily modified for the mission, increasing her armor plating and equipping it with an advanced mech gun and state-of-the-art fusion drive, among other upgrades. Before the Autumn got too far out, though, a system-wide order came through, ordering all in-system ships to Rally Point Zulu to cut off a massive inbound Covenant fleet. Unknown to anyone, the Covenant had been led there by a tracking device secretly attached to the Iroquois. Keyes cancels Red Flag as he orders the Autumn to Rally Point Zulu, but is convinced by John 117 that the mission can continue, that the Spartans could capture a crippled ship during the upcoming battle. The initial wave of Covenant invaders is driven off by the 100-plus ship's overreach and its 20 orbital supermax, however, they were unable to stop the fleet from deploying hundreds of dropships to reach a surface to eliminate the orbital defense generators, which powered the orbital max. To make things worse, the fleet was regrouping for another attack, and the UNSC circumference had failed to erase its nav data. Recognizing the significance of this threat, Red Flag is put on hold and the Spartans are deployed. John 117, Linda 058, and James 005, comprising Blue Team, would board Gamma Station where the circumference was docked to erase the nav data, while the remaining 22 Spartans, Red Team, would go groundside to defend Reach's orbital defense generators. Blue Team is able to board the station, but lose James soon after when his thruster pack is hit by a needler round, sending him flying into space. John and Linda manage to finish the mission, destroying the nav data and even saving a group of Marines, including the one and only Sergeant Avery Johnson. As they move to escape, Linda is blasted by several plasma bolts, including one to the base of her head. Upon returning to the Autumn, she is rushed into cryo. John requests permission to recover Red Team from Reach, but is told that contact was lost after the team's Pelican was hit during re-entry. On the bridge, Captain Keyes orders Cortana to make a random slipspace jump as per Cole protocol. Unknown to anyone, she secretly pulls up the data recovered by the Iroquois, discovering the strange markings are in fact a star chart. From it, Cortana is able to pull a set of coordinates to an unknown destination. The Autumn, pursued by the fleet of particular justice, makes her final slipspace jump to the mysterious ring world that would be known as Halo. And that is Halo Fall of Reach. Well, the original story anyway. The 2010 and 2011 editions include a number of extra stories that add to the universe as a whole and help connect the Fall of Reach to Halo Reach. The first is a transcript of the interrogation of Subject 386 and Elite, by Admiral Cole in 2530, a scene we saw briefly in Halo Wars Genesis. The second is a message from Supreme Commander Loru Taralumi, the gold armored elite from the package in Halo Legends, to the Vice Cleric of Zeal following the Battle of Meridim. This was the battle during which Spartan Sheila 065 was killed and Halsey was captured. The transmission itself was sent after the events of the package. Third is a transmission from Vice Admiral Berlin M. Tursk to Captain Lucius Giron concerning the capture of Halsey. Fourth is a message between two people named Mike and Agnes, two Oni employees, concerning Ralph 103's reintegration into society following the events of Homecoming. Fifth is a transmission from Captain Keyes to Vice Admiral Copan Insingil. It's set during the Autumn's final shakedown and reveals that Keyes is, by this point at least, aware of the invasion on Reach. Sixth is an Oni Post incident report concerning a conversation between Sergeants Joseph Poteet and Alistair Schicker and how it may have resulted in a security breach contributing to the Covenant's discovery of Reach. This would seem to be an early attempt by 343 to explain how the fleet of Valiant Prudence discovered Reach independently of the fleet of Particular Justice. However, with fleet battles revealing exactly how Ro Barutami discovered Reach, whether this conversation was an actual contributing factor remains unknown. The final bonus is a full transcript of the Winter Contingency. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the full contents of Halo The Fall of Reach. The book was, for many, their first delve into the Halo universe and for others, their first look at Halo's larger story and lore. To this day, it remains the gold standard for Halo fiction for many and is almost always the first book recommended when someone wants to get into the novels. The bonus stories and text included in the 2010 and 2011 editions only further cement the importance of this novel to the Halo canon. As such, there's no real choice but to give it a 10 out of 10. It's a well-deserved rating and I don't think any of my subscribers would allow me to even consider going any lower. I hope you all enjoyed this flashback review. It's been a lot of fun on my end, that's for sure. Going forward with the series, I'm going to let you, the fans, decide what I review next. It can be any piece of existing Halo media other than stuff I've already reviewed. The two exceptions would be Halo Nightfall, as I can do a review of the DVD Blu-ray cut, and Halo 4 Forward Unto Dawn, 
since my full review is no longer available and the DVD Blu-ray cut has some extra footage. So, what should I review next? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching as always, and until next time, this has been Halo Cannon. Hey guys, thanks for watching. Be sure to give a like and consider subscribing and sharing this video around. Also consider subscribing to Loot Crate. By going to trylootcrate.com slash halocanon and using promo code BRIDGE10, you can save 10% on a new subscription to the base Loot Crate offering. Loot Crate is a monthly subscription box service for epic geek and gamer items and pop culture gear.